Welcome once again to the Tabernacle series. And uh, we are glad that uh, we can join in for the few minutes that we can, that uh, we may be able to be blessed together. This is uh, number 11 in the series. And uh, we are looking at the types meet anti-type. And so may the Lord bless us as we go through this, shall we offer a word of prayer. Abba Father in heaven, we give you thanks and praise. All glory and honor be unto thee for the things that you do unto us. May you help us to appreciate every moment of our lives. Teach us to number our days that we may apply wisdom. And uh, after all has been said and done, Lord, let us review if really we are following after thee or uh, if we are following after vain things. Thank you for accepting us. And Lord, thank you for the sacrifice of your son, the atoning blood of your son. Your will be done, and uh, may you be with us always as we study in Jesus' name. Amen. And so we are in this uh, incredible journey of uh, knowing the will of God and uh, looking at uh, what uh, he is speaking unto us, that uh, we may be replenished by his word, we may be guided by his providence, and uh, above all, we may be able to sharpen each other as we go through this journey. The types meet uh, uh, anti-type. It is uh, a recapitulation of what we had and uh, adding some more information on this. Uh, we know that uh, we are in the day of uh, atonement and the feast that followed the feast uh, uh, of the day of atonement was uh, the feast of the tabernacles. And so, you know, the sanctuary feasts reveals the times that you're living in. In each feast, we realized what time we are in. And so if we are in the day of atonement, the feast that followed was uh, the feast of the tabernacles. And it is able to tell us which time are we living in. Um, the fact that we are in the day of atonement means that we, shall, we should be prepared any time the Lord will be coming for the feast of ingathering and he shall take those who are ready and they shall be able to have a thousand years with him in heaven, enjoying the peace unsurpassed, uh, being able to be with their Lord wherever he is. In Leviticus chapter 23, verses 33, and the Lord spake unto Moses saying, verse 4, 34, speak unto the children of Israel, saying, the 15th day of this seventh month shall be the feast of tabernacles for seven days unto the Lord. Uh, on the first day shall be an a holy convocation. You shall do no survival work there in. You shall do no survival there in. Um, in uh, verse 36, seven days he shall offer an offering made by fire unto the Lord. On the eighth day shall be an holy convocation unto you, and you shall offer an offering made by fire unto the Lord. It is a solemn assembly, and ye shall do no work therein. You shall do no work therein. Um, there were three habits in the Jewish agricultural system, and the harvest occurred in uh, three times a year, and that is um, we find that there was the barley harvest in the springtime, that is the months of March to May. And then we had the wheat harvest in the summer, that is the months of June to August. Then we had the, the fruit, olive and grape harvest in the autumn, that is the months of December to February. And so in Joel chapter one, verse 11, as, as we look at the Feast of the Tabernacles, we will be seeing the benefits that uh, we have with the Feast of the Tabernacles or uh, the prolapses of, uh, uh, or an afforded of uh, being in the Feast of the Tabernacle. What were the benefits that these people had in the Feast of the Tabernacles? What are the blessings we can enjoy as we look forward to the Feast of the Tabernacles? In Joel chapter 1, verse 11, we are told, Be ashamed, O ye husbandmen, all, O ye vine dressers, for the wheat and for the barley, because the harvest of the field is perished, the vine is dried up, and the fig tree languisheth, the pomegranate tree, the palm tree also, and the apple tree, even 
all the trees of the field are withered because joy is withered away from the sons of men. And um, why had uh, the joy withered amongst the Israelites? It was because of their iniquity. The Lord told them, walk in my ways, and then I shall bless you. Walk in my statutes, then I'll honor them that honor me. But they sought after Balim. They sought after walking after their own rekindling. And then uh, the Lord withdrew himself so that uh, they may be benefited with the gods they worship. At the end of the day, Joel laments that uh, all these um, blessings of the spring, of uh, the summer and the autumn had been withheld from uh, the children of Israel because they will not seek the Lord to worship him and uh, to uh, um, um, do his will. They wanted to get the blessings, but uh, they wanted to uh, uh, walk in their own ways. In fact, when you go to the book of uh, Haggai chapter one, quickly in your Bible, the book of uh, Haggai chapter one. In the book of Haggai chapter one, this is uh, what um, we get uh, from the word of God. Uh, in verses um, seven uh, to verses um, 11. Thus said the Lord of hosts, consider your ways, go up to the mountain and bring wood and build the house and I'll take pleasure in it and I'll be glorified, said the Lord. He looked for much and lo, it came too little. And when you brought it home, I did blow upon it. Why, said the Lord of hosts, because of mine house that is waste and ye run every man unto his own house. Therefore the heaven over you is stayed from dew and the earth is stayed from her fruit. And I called for a drought upon the land and upon the mountains and upon the corn and upon the new wine and upon the oil and upon that which the ground bringeth forth and upon men and upon cattle and upon all the labor of the hands. Why was the Lord so angry with Israel? Because when you go a few verses uh, back in chapter one, he says, thus speaketh the Lord of hosts saying, the people say the time is not come, the time that the Lord's house should be built. The, house, the Lord's house should be built. And uh, verse 3, then came the word of the Lord by Haggai the prophet saying, Is it time for you, O ye, to dwell in your uh, sealed houses, and this house lies west? Now, therefore, thus said the Lord of hosts, consider your ways. And that is what we are being called to do, to consider our ways, because much of the blessings of the day of atonement, and let us just say the, the, the blessings of the spring times, which is um, the benefits of the Passover, the unleavened bread, the fast fruit, and the feast of the weeks, which is the former rain, have been withheld from us. We are not experiencing it. And then you come to the, um, to the blessings of uh, the summer. You, you don't find that harvest even in agricultural year coming to us. And when you go to the feast, uh, the, the autumn, where actually we must be benefiting from the tabernacles or the prolepsis of it, or the aphortest of it, we find that uh, these blessings, which actually uh, uh, the latter rain uh, was before it, they are not in our lives. Why? Because the house of the Lord lies in ruin while we dwell in our houses. And what does it mean the house of the Lord to dwell in ruin? It is not doing the work that the Lord has given us to do for such a time as this. That is the living of the house to dwell in ruin. And so these blessings, Joel says that they have been withheld. And uh, why have they been withheld? Because of the iniquity of uh, the children of Israel. Um, we find in Deuteronomy chapter 16, uh, three times in a year shall all thy males appear before the Lord thy God in the place which he shall choose in the feast of unleavened bread and in the feast of weeks and in the feast of tabernacles and they shall not appear before the Lord empty. And so um, the, the feast of unleavened bread, that was a year gathering, the feast of the week, that was a year gathering and the feast of the tabernacles. And then it says, no one should be appearing before me empty-handed, which means that um, everyone should not just appear as a mere attender 
in these feasts as uh, not a servant of the Lord, because we know that right now thus, uh, the sacrificial system has been uh, uh, done away with, but uh, we know that uh, we share in the blessings of doing the work that should be done at a, such a time as this. Everyone should be involved in the spreading of the third angel's message in preparation for the second coming of Christ. No one should appear before the Lord empty-handed. And so three specific times were appointed for Israel assembly at Jerusalem to observe religious activities. And that is the feast of uh, the unleavened bread. That is the Passover, the feast of the harvest weeks or Pentecost, the feast of ingathering, that is the tabernacle or booths. But we ask ourselves, why should we gather in the feast of the booths? Why should we gather in the feast of the booths? The answer is found in Leviticus chapter 23, verses 42. Ye shall dwell in booths seven days. All that are Israel's born shall dwell in booths. That your generations may know that I made the children of Israel to dwell in booths when I brought them out of the land of Egypt. I'm the Lord, the, I am the Lord your God. And so the, the very reason of dwelling in the booths is for our membrane that the Lord has taken us out of Egypt. And uh, Egypt is referred to as the world in scriptures. It means the customs of the world, the things of the world, the iniquity of the world, the love and the passion of the world. So the tabernacle was to remind them that uh, they had received salvation from God and they were not uh, of this world, but they belonged to heaven. And um, when the Lord comes after the day of atonement, you know, the feast of the tabernacles happened after the day of atonement. And um, his main purpose was uh, for the children of Israel who had passed through the day of atonement and had been accepted, they may be able to dwell uh, a peaceful people, not molested by anyone no wars, no hunger, but just enjoying the benefits of atonement. So we expect Christ to come and take those who have been able to pass through the day of atonement and be able to dwell with him. It was a blessing and uh, the high priest was to be able to bless the children of Israel and they were to do no other things but just to enjoy the benefits of atonement. And this is what we are waiting for they had to remember that they had been taken out of the land of Egypt. And God is in the business of taking us out of the land of Egypt. And we don't have to wait until the Feast of the Tabernacle, the ingathering, the second coming, to be able to share in the blessings of the Feast of the Tabernacles. We can enjoy freedom from sin right now because what we shall be in heaven, we must be here on earth. And so... Uh, the autumn feast, that is the feast of the tabernacle, was the closing gathering of the year. The sun and rain had caused the earth to produce her fruits. From the valleys and plains of Palestine, the harvest had been gathered. The olive berries had been picked and the precious oil stored in bottles. The palm had yielded her store. The purple clusters of the vine had been trodden in the wine press. That is DA 447.2. So, Every blessing that could have ever been bestowed to Israel had been bestowed. And so um, we are told that uh, the feast in DA 448.2, this feast was not only the harvest thanksgiving, but the memorial of God's protecting care over Israel in the wilderness. In commemoration of their tenth life, the Israelites during the feast dwelt in booths or tabernacles of green bounds and uh, we understand green is uh, a, 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 a sign of new life a sign of a new leaf a sign of uh, a, a, a something new in our lives and so israel's ten life in uh, pp3 or 1.2 and now before them in solemn majesty mount sinai lifted it is massive front the cloudy pillar rested upon it is summit, and the people spread their tents upon the plain beneath. Here was to be their home for nearly a year. At night, the pillar of fire assured them of the divine protection, and while they were locked in a slumber, the bread of heaven fell gently upon the encampment. So we see that this was a month of blessing. 
In Exodus 16, verse 1, and they took their journey from Elim, and all the congregation of the children of Israel came unto the wilderness of Sin, which is between Elim and Sinai, on the 15th day of the second month after their departing out of the land of Egypt. And when you go to Exodus chapter 9, verses 1, we find that in the third month, when the children of Israel were gone from out of the land of Egypt, the same day came they into the wilderness of Sinai uh, or Sinai. And uh, in all these, in all these things, God was um, their protector. God was their protector, and he was providing them with everything that they needed. That uh, as they were in the wilderness, they lacked nothing. And so even as we are in the wilderness, there is nothing we lack. Christ has offered himself for us. And um, all the blessings that uh, are decreed in his word has been bestowed upon his people. When uh, you read the book of Deuteronomy, chapter 1, verses 2, the book of Deuteronomy, chapter 1, verses 2, uh, this is what the Bible really says uh, in Deuteronomy chapter 1, verses 2. There are 11 days' journey from Hore by the way of Mount Seir unto Kadesh Barnea. They arrived at Kadesh Barnea within 14 months from Egypt. Now, um, it is amazing, and uh, I shall be speaking about this as we come to an end. Uh, in, uh, in Deuteronomy chapter 1, verses 2, we, are find, we find that there are 11 day journey from Horeb by the way of Mount Sinai, Mount Seir, and we shall be looking at to that, how today it uh, represents our journey into the wilderness as we wait for the second coming of Jesus Christ. Um, we shall be looking into that deeply. So, in uh, autumn harvest for possessing, that is Numbers 1320, now the time was the time of the first, uh, first, uh, first ripe grapes in uh, 23, and they came unto the brook of Eskol and cut down from them a branch with one cluster of grapes, and they bear it between two upon a staff, and they brought of the pomegranates and of um, the, the, the figs. To, to, to just show that it was the Lord who was leading them all through, he allowed them even to have these, um, uh, 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 um, these uh, fruits that uh, grow by their own. Now, these fruits that, that grow by their own, what, what does it mean unto us that um, the gift of salvation, uh, the, the salvation is a gift. It's not something that you can buy uh, anyway. The children of Israel in the wilderness had all providences, not by their works, but by the providence of God. And it was a part of the plan of redemption to show the church and to show the children of God how they are saved. It is not by our works, but it is a gift that no one should boast about it. So the journey of the Israelites in the wilderness really teaches the lesson of righteousness by faith. And that is the lesson we have to learn before even we are uh, translated to heaven, that uh, Christ is working for our salvation. It is a gift that no man should boast about it. And so we find that um, the spring types were fulfilled to the letter as uh, we saw when we were going through the spring feast. And then we find that um, even the autumn, uh, uh, as, as even the spring feasts were fulfilled, not only to the event, but at the time. So also we, we are told that um, in um, Great Controversy, page 399, in the like manner, the types which relate to the second advent must be fulfilled at the time appointed out in the symbolic service. So everything happens in time. Everything happens in time. And uh, let us try to look. Uh, as the Adventist people started studying the sanctuary, 
um, what was their experience as they went through the sanctuary, as the types met the antitype? We, we have seen the spring feasts and how they relate unto us. We have gone through them in the first presentations. Let us, as we go into the second uh, segment of uh, our tabernacle, the tabernacle presentation, see how the fall feasts, how even uh, the Adventist uh, movement had an experience in these uh, messages and uh, what kind of uh, things they were able to learn. In uh, Great Controversy 1888 edition, page 398, paragraph 4, Arguments drawn from the Old Testament types also pointed to the autumn as the time when the event represented by the cleansing of the sanctuary must take place. This was made very clear as attention was given to the manner in which the types relating to the first advent of Christ had been fulfilled. So these people seeing that uh, the types of the spring were fulfilled to the event and time, they started looking into the minute details of uh, the feasts of the autumn, if they will be fulfilled also to the event and the time. And uh, we continue reading in page 399, paragraph three, the 10th day of the seventh month, the great day of atonement, the time of the cleansing of the sanctuary, within the year 1844 fell upon the 22nd of October, was regarded as the time of the Lord's coming. This was in harmony with the proofs already presented that the 2300 days will terminate in the autumn and the conclusion seems irresistible. So this was their experience at that time. You find that uh, Passover was fulfilled to the time and event that is uh, on the Nissan 14, Christ's death, and leaving Nissan 15, Christ's burial, the wave ship on Nissan 16, Christ's resurrection, then 50 days later or after, we had the Feast of the Weeks, which is the Pentecost Christ inauguration. Then we have the trumpets in Tishri. Uh, first, the first angels and the second angel, we had the Day of Atonement in Tishri, the tenth. The angel of uh, the, the third angel's message was uh, started to be sounded when uh, the sanctuary message, uh, when the Sabbath message um, was uh, uh, given. Uh, when uh, the law was revealed, when the Sabbath message was revealed, and it's around uh, 1846 uh, uh, going to 1848, uh, and then we had the vision at Rochester, where it was revealed that the ceiling now had uh, started, and James White had to write the, 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 the pamphlet for the ceiling message. Then we had the tabernacle, which should start on the autumn on Tishri. 15. And so you find that um, the spring feasts happen on time and the fall feasts have to happen in time. But if there is a problem, why is there a problem? In uh, TM 364, paragraph 2, we are told everything in our world is in agitation. Coming events cast their shadows before. The signs of the times are ominous indeed. And then uh, Spirit of Prophecy, Volume 1, page uh, 201, paragraph 1. The Passover pointed backward to the deliverance of the children of Israel and was also typical, pointing forward to Christ, the Lamb of God, slain from the, for the redemption of the fallen man. The type had reached the antitype when Christ, the Lamb of God, without blemish, died upon the cross. He left an ordinance to commemorate the events of his crossing fiction. And so... Um, and we understand that is uh, the Lord, Lord's Supper or uh, the Holy Communion. And now the Feast of the Tabernacles was not only commemorative, but typical. It not only pointed back to the wilderness sojourn, but as the Feast of Harvest, it celebrated the ingathering of the fruits of the earth and pointed forward to the great day of final ingathering, when the Lord of the Harvest shall send forth his reapers to gather the tares together in bundles for the fire and to gather the wheat into his garner. And so we are talking about a commemorative feast, but also a typical feast. And so as we always do the camp meetings, although it's not the typical 
Feast of the Tabernacles. It is a commemorative Feast of the Tabernacles and enjoying the uh, blessing which the Lord has uh, even given unto us, victory over sin coming from the world. So we commemorate our coming out of uh, uh, the world of sin as we look forward to the typical Feast of the Tabernacles, which is the in-gathering when the Lord of harvest shall send forth his reapers to gather the uh, tears together in bundles for the fire and to gather the wheat into his garner. And so it is not bad to have the Feast of the Tabernacles as a commemorative of overcoming sin as we do it as the camps. We are not doing it as a typical service, but as a commemorative uh, 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 appreciation to the Lord for bringing us out of the world and sitting us up in heavenly places with himself and his son. And so um, we have to continue wrestling with the Lord as even Jacob wrestles with the Lord at night. In Genesis chapter 32, verse 26, we find, and he said, let me go for the day breaketh. And he said, I'll not let thee go except thou bless me. And he said unto him, what is thy name? And he said, Jacob. And he said, thy name shall be called no more Jacob, but Israel. For us, a prince, hast thou power with God and with men and has prevailed. Now, this issue of um, commemorating God, taking us out of sin and struggling with him until he changes us his name, we read in the book of um, Revelation, Revelation chapter 3, Revelation chapter 3, Revelation chapter 3, and uh, verses uh, 12. Him that overcometh, and the overcoming is not in the second coming. We have to overcome before probation closes. Him that overcometh will I make a pillar into the temple of my God, and he shall go no more out, and I'll write upon him the name of my God, and the name of the city of my God, which is New Jerusalem, which cometh down out of heaven from my God, and I'll write upon him my new name. And so even as Jacob was given a new name, so even in the typical feast of the tabernacles, our name shall be changed as overcomers. And uh, uh, we shall have the name of the city of God, which is the new Jerusalem. And so we have to wrestle with God until we overcome, and then uh, our names will be changed. And in this struggle, we are told that uh, work out your salvation with fear and trembling, for it is God who worketh in you to do um, uh, uh, of his own pleasure, to will and to do of his own pleasure. Philippians chapter 1 verse 6 says that uh, the one who has started the work in you shall accomplish it even unto the day of the Lord. And so we need not to worry about anything. We just need to avail ourselves and surrender and then the work that Christ has started, he shall do in us. And so except thou bless me, those who will face the last great crisis of the ages must develop the powerful attributes of perseverance, persistent determination, dedication, decision, firmness, resolution, purpose, consistency, indomitableness, stability, strength, steadfastness, constant courage, certainty, and soundness. They don't need to waver in anything. They have to rely on their Lord. And uh, as even Jacob was able to wrestle with God, we have to wrestle with God and tell him, I'll not let thee go except thou bless me. And so we must overcome every besetting sin. And uh, we have a beautiful verse in the book of, uh, in the book of uh, Hebrews chapter 12, in the book of Hebrews chapter 12. Hebrews chapter 12, we are told, wherefore seeing we also are combust about with so great a cloud of witness, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which doth so easily beset us, and let us run with patience the rest that is set before us. Verse 2, looking unto Jesus, the, uh, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. 
And so we have a cloud of witness, which are these cloud of witness that people who have been mentioned in the book of Hebrews chapter 11 are the cloud of witness that they were able to overcome by faith. Read the uh, 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 Hall of Fame, the Faith Hall of Fame in Hebrews uh, uh, 11. And you are told that as even we have a cloud of witness, let us set aside. If they overcame, we also can overcome. And why? So that we may be prepared for the Feast of the Tabernacles. For no one enters into the Feast of Tab Tabernacles when uh, they are still defiled, when they are still defiled. Um, in Jeremiah chapter 30, verses 5. For thus said the Lord, we have heard a voice of trembling of fear and not of peace. Ask ye now and see whether a man doth prevail with a child. Wherefore do I see every man with his hands on his loins as a woman travail and all faces are turned into paleness. Alas, for that day is great so that none is like it. It is even the time of Jacob's trouble, but he shall be saved out of it. For it shall come to pass in that day with the Lord, save the Lord of hosts, that I'll break his yoke from off thy neck and will burst thy bones, and strangers shall no more serve themselves of him. And so, even though it be a very dark day, those who are in Christ shall be saved. We have to break every yoke. We are yoked to many things that prevent us from realizing the blessings or the blessedness of freedom. Fear is the yoke that enslaves us, but God has promised to break every yoke. He says that when you pass through the swelling of Jordan, I shall be with you. I think that is um, Isaiah 43. Let us look at um, Isaiah chapter 43. In preparation to the feast of the tabernacles, the Lord is promising to take us through as even he took through Israel all through the journey of um, uh, the wilderness. In uh, Isaiah chapter 43, verses 1 and 2, the Bible says, Isaiah 43, verses 1, 2, we are told, But now thus saith the Lord that created thee, O Jacob, and he that formed thee, O Israel, fear not, for I have redeemed thee, I have called thee by thy name, thou art mine. When thou passest through the waters, I will be with thee, and through the rivers they shall not overflow thee. When thou walkest through the fire, thou shalt not be burned, neither shall the flame kindle upon thee. For I am the Lord thy God, the Holy of Israel, thy Savior. I gave Egypt for thy ransom, Ethiopia and Seba for thee. And we find that um, in the day of atonement, we have to be taken out of Egypt completely to prepare for the Feast of the Tabernacles, which is the Feast of Ingathering, the second coming of Jesus Christ. Now, we have to remember that um, we were told that uh, the Feast of the Tabernacle uh, was not only uh, a typical uh, feast, but also it was uh, a commemorative service. And so we can have a come meeting as um, a commemoration of being taken out of uh, this um, uh, world out of sin. It, it was in PP. 541.2, and uh, I'll just have uh, for our benefit projected once again, that uh, the Feast of the Tabernacle was not only commemorative, but typical. It not only pointed back to the wilderness sojourn, but as the Feast of Harvest, it celebrated the ingathering of the fruits of the earth and pointed forward to the great day of final ingathering, when the Lord of the harvest shall send forth the reapers to gather the tares together in bundles for the fire and to gather the wheat in his garner. So, we have this Feast of the Tabernacle, not only as a typical service, which is the in gathering the second coming of Jesus Christ, but commemorative of being taken um, through, uh, uh, taken from the wilderness, sojourn. And so when we look at our lives and what Christ has done for us, will it not be good to have the Feast of the Tabernacles, the come meeting, I mean, not in a typical way, but in a commemorative way? not by dates, but um, as uh, just uh, a, 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 a celebration, a time of sharing our experiences, a time for socializing, a time for 
uh, giving out blessings to others because um, uh, the Lord has done so great in our lives. So we commemorate our journey um, uh, in the wilderness, uh, the way we have been in the wilderness and have been taken out of it as we wait for the typical uh, feast of the tabernacles. And so uh, when, when people gather for the camp meetings, it should not be confused as the feast of the tabernacles in a typical way, because that is in the future. That is the in gathering, that is the second coming. But as we gather for the camp meetings, and if you want to call it the feast of tabernacles, then you should call it knowing what it means. It is only in a commemorative way, not in a typical way. I think uh, the, the point, that point is um, uh, clear. And so continued on, um, every yoke has to be broken. If we will enter into the feast in the typical feast of the tabernacles, then we have to be the people who share in the blessings of uh, the atonement. We have to be the people who have overcome sin according to the book of uh, Revelation chapter three, that um, it is only the overcomers that will have a new name that will be in the typical feast of um, uh, anti-typical feast of uh, the tabernacles. But now as um, I enter into the last segment of um, this preparation to enter into the feast of the tabernacles, why has there been a delay? When uh, the high priest entered into the most holy place to officiate in the day of atonement, it only took one day and he came out of uh, the most holy place. But we see we have been in the day of atonement since 1844 until 170 plus years have elapsed. What is the problem? Why has the Lord tarried in coming? What is really happening? I'll, 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 let us go through a few statements which sheds light on what is happening and why, if there is a delay, there has been a delay. In uh, PP, that is uh, Patriarchs and Prophets, page uh, 376, paragraph 3, we read that uh, a distance of only 11 days' journey lay between Sinai and Kadesh on the borders of Canaan. They had just to take 11 days to move from Egypt to Canaan. But what is the problem here? And it was the it, and it was with the prospect of speedily entering the goodly land that the host of Israel resumed their march when the cloud at last gave the signal for onward movement. Jehovah had wrought wonders in bringing them from Egypt, and what blessings might they not expect now that they had formally called Benande to accept him as their sovereign and had been acknowledged as the chosen people of the Most High. Yet that 11 days journey had to take another 40 day, 40 years. Why? Because of the unbelief of the children of Israel. And now we are told this, that um, um, in 1856, E.G. White had a vision, which was really amazing. This vision in 1856 recorded in T, uh, Testimonies to the Church. Volume 1, page 131, page 132. This is the vision she had in 1856. I was shown the company present at the conference, said the angel, some food for the worms, some subjects of the seven last plagues, some will be alive and remain upon the earth to be translated at the coming of Jesus. When you really casually read the, 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 the quote, it tells you that in 1856, and that period, just uh, after that, the prophet was expecting Jesus Christ to come because seven last plagues happens, then Christ comes. But then, since 1856, we are still here and Christ has not come. Now, continued on, in uh, Broadside uh, Volume 2, January 31, 1849, Paragraph 11, just prior to the 1856 vision, this is what we read. I saw that the time for Jesus to be in the most holy place was nearly finished. This is before 1856, where she says some food for the uh, worm and some uh, for the seven last plagues. In 1849, that is seven years before that vision, she says she saw that the time for Jesus to be in the most holy place was nearly finished. And that time can last but a very little longer. 
and what leisure time we have should be spent in searching the Bible, which is to judge us in the last day. What else did the prophet say? Why the delay? Testimonies of the Church, Volume 3, page 159, paragraph 1. Because time is short, we should work with diligent and double energy. Our children may never enter college. This, she has this idea that Christ is on the way, but they can obtain an education in those essential branches which they can turn to a practical use and which will give, um, which will give culture to the mind and bring its powers into use. Very many youth who have gone through a college course have not obtained that true education that they can put to practical use. They may have the name of having a college education, but in reality, they are only educated uh, dunes. And so she still expects Christ to come. We are looking at why the delay, why has the Feast of the Tabernacle in its typical way delayed? In uh, 1SM 68, that is Selected Messages, Book 1, page 68, paragraph 1, she says, had had Adventist after the great disappointed, disappointment in 1844 held fast their faith and followed on unitedly in the opening providence of God, receiving the message of the third angel and in the power of the Holy Spirit proclaiming it to the world, they will have seen the salvation of God. The Lord will have wrought mightily with their efforts the work will have been completed and Christ will have come ere this to receive his people to their reward. Amazing when you read these statements. And then we have this, if every soldier of Christ, this is General Conference Daily Bulletin, February 28, 1893, paragraph five. If every soldier of Christ had done his duty, if every watchman on the walls of Zion had given the trumpet a certain sound, the world might ere this have had the message of warning but the work is years behind. What account will be rendered to God for thus retarding the work? Again, another quote, uh, and uh, I'll skip over that. And uh, we, we, we are told something that um, in uh, Christ's Christian service, the, the, the kind of the time that uh, we are living in right now. And uh, this was in Testimonies, Volume 9, page 14, and uh, Testimonies, Volume 1, page 268. The world is stirred with the spirit of war. The prophecy of the 11th chapter of Daniel has nearly reached its complete fulfillment, and that was back in 1890s. Soon the sins of trouble spoken of the prophecies will take place. I was shown the inhabitants of the earth in uttermost confusion, war, bloodshed, privation, want, famine, and pestilence were abroad in the land. My attention was then called from the scene. There seemed to be a little time of peace. Once more, the inhabitants of the earth were presented before me, and again, everything was in the uttermost confusion, utmost confusion. Strife, war, and bloodshed with famine and pestilence raged everywhere. Other nations were engaged in this war and confusion. War caused famine, wound and bloodshed caused pestilence, and then men's heart failed them for fear and for looking after those things which are coming on the earth. And you, you find that these are the messages in 1856 to 1890s, but the Lord has not come. Why? Because the people who are supposed to be preparing to enter into the typical feast, anti-typical feast of the tabernacles, have not broken every yoke that binds them. There's still love for the things of this world. There is still following after the things of this world. And then Christ cannot do a work in our lives to accomplish that which he wants to accomplish in us. And so what can I say? I can only say, as Peter says, God is not slack in doing in what he has promised to do for us. In fact, we are the only people who can delay Christ from coming from the most holy place. By our way of deportment, by our way of contact, Peter say we should not just wait for the second coming of Jesus Christ, but we should hasten it. Redeeming the time, knowing that the times are evil. Whatever time that we have been left with, let us pray like David, 
teach us to number our days that we may apply wisdom unto it. If we don't do this, there will be a time when Christ shall pronounce what is written in Revelation 22, 11, whoever is filthy, let him continue to be filthy. Whoever is righteous, let him continue to be righteous. And behold, I come and my reward is with me to give every man according to the deeds of his flesh or according to his work. And so, brothers and sisters, as uh, we are waiting for the feast of in gathering, the feast of the tabernacles, the anti-type to meet the type, I ask myself and I ask you, for the great day of the wrath of God has come and we shall be able to stand. Are we availing ourselves to be benefited by the merits of his blood or are we walking in our own ways? And so may the Lord give us the strength and remember he who has started a good work in you will be able to accomplish it until the day of the Lord. Shall we pray in closing? Our Heavenly Father, glory and honor be unto thee, Lord. It is because of uh, our hardness of the heart that uh, the second coming has not been realized. And we pray that, Lord, you may do a work of preparation in us. We know it's a great work, but in a little time, you may prepare us for the feast of ingathering. Help us not to wait in idleness, but to be at your service. Your name be glorified. In Jesus' name we pray these things. Amen. Amen.